Bom dia. Good morning. Good morning. I'll request your patience so you can listen to me for a few minutes because I'll make a quick presentation that I prepared previously. It's an, impro uh, an improvisation, and after that, we would start a session of Q&A because I don't know how long that will last. I have other meetings after this, but I'll try to answer as many questions as I can, okay? So, as you well know, Brazil nominated on 28th of December my candidacy to the uh, position of WTO Director General. It will be vacant starting in September when the term of office of the Director General Pascal Lamy expires on 31st of August. The nomination was made by the President after internal consultations were made and several ministries ministries participated in the nomination. So it's a state decision and all of the competent areas of the government are working to promote this candidacy. The decision of the Brazilian government was based on our willingness to contribute to the revitalization of WTO and the multilateral system as a whole that is going through a very difficult moment, especially in the area of negotiations. The evolution of the system and the disciplines of the WTO is paralyzed because of serious problems. These problems have not yet been overcome by the members. This paralysis is quite concerning because of the uncertainties that present themselves in terms of the world trade in the current process of recovery from the financial crisis of 2008 and its consequences. The Brazilian government is quite concerned with this paralysis that exists in the multilateral system, and Brazil was one of the driving forces be behind the Doha round, and we're working to reap results from the single undertaking until the next ministerial meeting of the organization in Bali that will happen in December of 2013. The observance and the advancement of the disciplines of the WTO are fundamental for multilateralism in trade. They're necessary. We need solutions, ambitious solutions and consensual solutions to promote the opening of the world trade, the elimination of its main distortions, and the use of trade as an instrument for the development of all, but especially of the developing countries, the poorest countries. In this context, the Brazilian government tried to present a candidate that could contribute to overcome these problems and for the evolution of the system. With this spirit, the Brazilian government decided to nominate the candidate. Other eight countries nominated their own candidates that participated in the selection process. These candidates will have up until 31st of March to present themselves to the WTO in the way they find most appropriate. The first formal contact will be done through presentations, followed by questions and answers, and the candidates will be in Geneva in the 29th, 30th, and 31st of January. The presentations will be made according to the order of presentation of the candidacies, and my presentation is foreseen for the 31st of January. The final phase will happen from 1st of April to 31st of May at the most. It's not a traditional scrutiny with the counting of votes, but it's an exercise of consensus around the most feasible candidacy. Brazil had the opportunity of expressing in several moments its understanding that the next director general should come from a developing country, from Africa or from Latin America and Korea, the Caribbean. And this is based on the perception that it's necessary to have an alternance between the geographical regions and also an alternance between the developed and developing countries. In the 
previous selection processes, Brazil always based its performance on three basic criteria for the profile of the Director General. First, a commitment to the strengthening of the multilateral system for trade. The second, the experience and knowledge in the topics dealt with by the WTO. And thirdly, the capability of facilitating consensus presenting balanced solutions and responding to the expectations of the different member states. My CV is available for you all. Ever since 2008, I'm the permanent representative of Brazil uh, to the WTO. Before going to Geneva, I was head of the area for dispute settlement. There, after that, director of the economic department, and then I was uh, the head of the technological and scientific department. And then I was head of the dispute settlement unit. I also carried out several other activities as a permanent representative to the WTO. As a negotiator, my objective was always to build bridges between my peers in Geneva. And in this process of building bridges, it's fundamental to get to know the disciplines, the history of the negotiations, the positions of the negotiators, the sensitivities of each of the parts. The solutions must be creative, innovative, and above anything else, feasible. In my trajectory, I believe will help in this role of facilitator of consensus. The problems in the Doha negotiation rounds are a result of the different differences of opinion. It's fundamental for the future director general to transit between the different country groupings regardless of the level of development of the countries without trying to impose its, his or her own perspectives. We should try to obtain the possible consensus. The Brazilian government is quite convinced that my candidacy brings all of these attributes and therefore these are the words I would have to share with you to open up our dialogue. And now I'm ready to try to answer your questions. Good afternoon. I'm from Reuters Ambassador. I have four questions. Four, OK. First, I'd like to know if Brazil has received public support from other countries from the WTO, and if you, during your campaign, and if you are elected as Director General, will you advocate the idea of including the uh, currency and the exchange rate as one of the main matters to be dealt with in the WTO? Regarding public support, the campaign is just beginning. We launched the candidacy a few days ago. There's an entire process of consultation that has to be made to other countries. But what I can tell you now is that without making a survey of who said yes, who demonstrated support, I can say that in general, we're very satisfied with the receptiveness of the Brazilian candidacy, both from the developing and developed countries and in all geographical regions in our own continent and also in all other continents. And this makes us very proud. We see this as something quite positive. And at least one country, Argentina, formalized its support publicly on the day that we launched the candidacy. It was a very sympathetic gesture. We have received several other manifestations of support, but for reasons that are obvious, we should not talk about the reactions of each of the members to this candidacy. Regarding the issue of the exchange rate, if I'm elected, the Director General never will have the competence or the capability of imposing any topic 
for the WTO. The exchange rate is discussed by the WTO, not because the Director General wanted it to be so, but because the members willed it so. We made a proposal. The proposal was accepted. This is a proposal to discuss the topic, start a debate about this topic. This proposal was accepted by all, all of the members. In the moment in which all of the members accept the dialogue, and it's a dialogue that is a continuous dialogue. We have meetings that have been happening, and we have another meeting that is scheduled for April. I think we will have a, a meeting in April about this. We will invite a representative from the IMF to participate. What will happen after April? This is a decision that is up to the members. The members will decide if they will continue this dialogue. But if we have a consensus from the members to continue a dialogue about the exchange rate, then we will continue a dialogue about this matter. But when the members reach a consensus that it's no longer the case to continue with this dialogue, then the dialogue will be interrupted. But this is not something that is up to the Director General alone. This is a decision made by the members, and this is something quite typical at the WTO. You are all aware of this. The WTO is an organization that is led by its members. The Director General can only facilitate the dialogue among the members, but the decision about any matter, about how it will be carried forth, this is a decision that must be made by the members themselves. I think we have to remember that there's a distinction among different things. Several of the things that I did, I was representing the Brazilian government in that position. These are not things that, as a director general, I will be compelled to continue doing. I will be the director general of the members. In this specific case, regarding the exchange rate, I participated in a process in which we launched this dialogue. This was a long process. We had several consultations with other members. I visited several ambassadors. We talked about how this conversation could be useful, because a conversation about the exchange rate can have different manners. We can speak about different things. We could have constructive debates or not, and we reached an understanding that we should have a construct constructive approach to the exchange rate at the WTO. At least we have laid down the basis. At least this is what was done when the dialogue was launched. But my successor, the ambassador of Brazil, that will be nominated after me, and the other permanent representatives, they will be the ones who will decide how this dialogue will be continued. And if I am elected, my job will be to facilitate this dialogue. This is all I could do as Director General. No other questions? Rosana from the newspaper Correio Brasiliense, Ambassador. From now on, I would like you to elaborate on what will be your agenda. Because in the IMF, there's a visitation by the part of the countries. How will this work? How will you ca or your campaign work? And how Brazil, Brazil is uh, mentioned as a country that is becoming more protectionist. How will you align your discourse of free flow of trade with this other position of protectionism? How will you align these two matters? Regarding the campaign itself, as I said before, the candidates have until the end of March to present themselves to the members. Each candidate will do this in his or her own way. I intend to visit several countries to present myself, to introduce myself, to introduce my contributions to the multilateral system of trade to remove any doubts. They will probably make questions. They will try to uh, understand what my standpoint is. We are working in this program of trips or visits, but we only have two and a half months 
so it's a short period of time. It's 159 members. I won't be able to visit all of the places, but I'll do whatever is possible. I'll try to visit the countries that probably those in our region, the Americas, and the other regions as best as possible. But the Brazilian government is mobilizing itself to overcome this problem of the time frame so that we can clarify our objectives, our purpose, and what are the goals of the Brazilian candidacy. I, moving on to your second question about protectionism of Brazil, this alleged protectionism, this is something that some analysts claim, but Brazil, at least on my perspective, I see Brazil as an asset, not a liability. Brazil is a founding member of the WTO. It's a country that is seen within the WTO as a country that articulates solutions, that is proactive, that fought in an extraordinary way to advance the negotiations in Doha. All of the members of the WTO are aware of our background. And now that we are making efforts to obtain results in the Interministerial Conference of Bali, Brazil is one of the central countries in this effort. It's building consensus. It coordinates the G20, making proposals in the agricultural area that are quite constructive. They're not maximized. Max maximalist proposals and this role of Brazil, this capability of Brazil of articulating and strengthening the multilateral system, this is something that everybody is aware of and I believe that measures that were taken by Brazil and that were not ex well accepted by other countries but I think this happens with almost all of the countries it's normal for a country to adopt a position and not everybody has to agree. That's why we have the consultation process where the members talk to each other and remove any doubts, ask questions, and as a last resort, we have the dispute settlement mechanism, which is a mechanism that works very well. And these difficulties that might exist concerning the measures that are taken by each country, this ultimately leads to the dispute settlement measurement. And therefore, we remove any problems because we, we have a more legal treatment of these situations. And then we have uh, better solutions for these issues, not as passionate solutions, but in general, I think that coming from Brazil and having the diplomatic background that Brazil has in the multilateral system, I think this is an asset. This is something quite positive, and it helps my, our campaign here in Brazil. You said you will explain your candidacy to the countries. How will you sensitize different countries to obtain their support? Ambassador Roberto Azevedo will say that Brazil is part of a context of my, of my diplomatic history and the way in which I conducted the works of the Brazilian delegation in Geneva. What I think that the WTO needs now, in the moment we are at now, this is the largest concern of the Brazilian government. We live through a moment in which the multilateral system for trade is virtually paralyzed, especially in the negotiations front. The WTO still works, the dispute settlement area still works very well. Could it be improved? Yes, it could, but this is a decision that is up to the members. But it works adequately in the area of negotiations, which is the most important area for the evolution of the disciplines, for the improvement of the commitments that are taken on by the countries in the WTO. This is an area that is paralyzed, and this is quite concerning. The evolution of the disciplines and the commitments in the WTO, maybe this is the best guarantee that the members might have against actions that are harmful for international trade and the growth of international commerce. I believe 
that Brazil and I myself have a background in the WTO of articulating consensus, of listening to all of the members, of having access to all of the members. We have legitimacy, we have the trust of the members. And regardless of the person, of the hierarchy, not everybody can do this. Not everybody can present solutions, solutions that are actually heard. Depending from the whom the proposal comes from, sometimes it's rejected by the member states because of the person who presented it. They don't even read the proposal sometimes because sometimes they have a certain prejudice regarding that delegation or that person specifically. So I think that the Brazilian delegation in Geneva and I myself, we transmit a feeling of trustworthiness among the members. It's not by chance that we, that my candidacy is very well received by different countries, developing countries and developed countries in Latin America and Asia and Africa. We received support from several countries and the management of the candidacy came from outside to within. And when we talked about this candidacy in the Brazilian government, other delegations came to me, came to Ambassador Valdemar and other people and said, you should launch a candidacy because you have a capability of articulating solutions. It's very hard to find this capacity within our circuit. And this is something quite positive. It would be a good contribution for the system. At first, we heard these inputs and said, OK. But I didn't take these very seriously in the beginning. But the pressure grew, and several delegations came to us. Several people who are important in the process came to us, tried to encourage us to launch the candidacy. They said that would, it would be important to have a contribution for Brazil, from Brazil. And we thought that it would be the case to launch the candidacy. Reflecting on this, we reached the conclusion that we actually have an important role to play. We have a contribution to provide, and we can work in this approximation process. Will I have absolute control over the process? No. That's not how it works, but we can help in the process. We can act as facilitators. Obviously, there is a possibility of hampering the process as well, but you can also help. So if I can contribute and help to overcome these gaps, reduce the distances, I think it would be worthwhile. Renata Agostini from the Folha de São Paulo. You commented that your candidacy is a state decision, but you also said that there is a difference. If you win, there's a difference in terms of the latitude of your work and what you will advocate. So what is the importance of Brazil launching a candidacy? And secondly, going back to the exchange rate, this is one of our flagships in Brazil. Based on your experience and what you already have done in this topic, what are the real chances that Brazil can actually establish this topic in the rules of the WTO? Regarding the first part of your question, the largest gain for Brazil is to provide a contribution and if we're successful we will be able to revitalize and strengthen the multilateral system. Brazil always fought for a strong multilateral system with specific and strict rules. When we have this mechanism in place, when it's working, this is what Brazil this is what we would have to gain from this process. We are against unilateral measures. In general, the position of the Brazilian government has been of inclusiveness where all of the members would participate and discuss and the disciplines would advance balanced in a balanced way. And if we give a contribution in which the system becomes more open and more functional, this on itself would already be a gain for the Brazilian government. This would be the largest gain that we would be able to obtain from this effort. Regarding the exchange rate, 
I think that a part, I remember very clearly because I participated in these discussions when the Brazilian government, we started to talk about this, about if it would be valid to introduce this discussion in the WTO, I participated in the initial dialogue. And at the, back then, the exchange rate was almost a taboo in most places in G20, and Ambassador Valdemar was a representative there. He said that there was no appetite to discuss this topic there. In the IMF, there was no willingness to discuss it either. So I thought there was a possibility of having this discussion in the WTO because of the competences, because uh, the exchange rate and trade are very closely connected. So if things were done adequately, if the topic was presented in a balanced way, it would be possible to have a conversation in the WTO regarding the relationship between the exchange rate and commerce and trade. And this was our objective in the beginning, to encourage the discussion so that it could take place in a rational way, without conflicts, without bloodbaths. There was no need for this type of problem. We could have a reasonable, a sound conversation about this, and it could be emulated in other forums, the G20, the IMF, other forums could start con talking about this as well. This is was our objective. In the time that we launched this, and the hardest problem that we faced was to initiate the conversations. We saw several sectors, several people, commenting that Brazil was doing that to obtain a protection mechanism, but that's not true. That's not how it started out. If something, somebody were to ask me, what is the protection mechanism that Brazil wants? And I would say, I have no idea. Nobody's talking about a protection mechanism. We didn't have this conversation. And I can say this, I feel at ease at saying this because I was there, I participated in this first dialogue that happened. Obviously that once we advance in the conversations, several stages have been followed through in the WTO. We had seminars, we had discussions from the working group the ex that examines this topic and we advanced. And it was something natural because we started to imagine what type of role the WTO can play with regards to the exchange rate and its relationship with trade. And my impression from the last conversation that we had at the WTO, I saw that if the members are willing to work in this area, but I think we're not mature enough to discuss the mechanisms themselves, what mechanisms will be adopted, but there's still a path that must be tread. We have to talk about the role of the IMF, the role of the WTO, what is the role of the G20 or other international forums. How can each of them contribute to this process? So in this moment, the WTO is in this phase in which we're trying to see how the WTO can contribute to this discussion in a more effective way, taking a look at this aspect of the exchange rate and trade and commerce. After this conversation has evolved and we're clearer on the position of each of the members, then we'll see what will happen. The members will decide what will be the next step. But this is something for the future. Translation apologizes, they're not using the microphone. Maybe this is true for some. The exchange rate, by definition, you have a valued and a devalued side. This is a mathematical definition. You have the valuation of one side and the devaluation of the other side. So when you have a devaluation on, on, on one side, you see that the, they won't be very interested in discussing this right now, but our approach has been to take a look at the long term. The Brazilian currency is quite valued right now. 
that. But if you take a look at the history of the Brazilian currency, there are moments of devaluation, there are moments of valuation, but the currency goes through these different periods and we don't want to have a solution that will be a threat to our exports in the future. We would have to have a solution that should be reasonable. It should be calibrated so that we could avoid that the natural trade flows were affected. This has to be very well calibrated. It's a sensitive discussion and we have not yet begun this discussion. These countries that say that the IMF, this is a topic for the IMF, and because this is very simplified, usually in the press, but we have a more complex conversation about this. When we talk about the impact of the exchange rate and commerce, the first issue that is brought up is how can you determine if your currency is undervalued or overvalued? How do you determine this? There are several ways of doing this. So you take a look at a historical figure and you say, uh, historically, it's high or it's low, and we had an abrupt change in some cases, so should we have some type of protection mechanism? This is a way of doing it, but several members say no. This is a very... It's, a, it's an inappropriate way of approaching the topic. We have to have a more sophisticated way of doing this. And this issue of the standards for valuation or devaluation, this is not up to the WTO. This is a topic that is under the mandate of the IMF. Brazil is quite clear on this. And what we're saying is that once you've determined, okay, the currency is overvalued or undervalued. Regarding trade, what will you do? Will we maintain it? Does the WTO have the necessary mechanisms? And this second stage of the process should not be done by the IMF. IMF will not dwell on the topic of commerce. It will only make an assessment of the optimal standards for the currency, but the impact on trade and how to deal with the consequences of this on commerce, this is not up to the IMF. I don't think that any delegation in Geneva thinks this. This is up to the WTO, but how we will do this at the WTO, this is another story. I would like to, you talked about the paralysis of the negotiations. We can say that the priority, your priority would be to boost the negotiations and conclude the Doha round. And in a moment of crisis in which we are going through, what would this multilateral agreement look like, this less ambitious uh, agreement look like? Do you have a deadline for this? I think that today in Geneva, Anybody who participates in the meetings will see that there's a willingness by the part of the members of continuing the agenda that we developed in the area of negotiations. The effort to obtain an anticipated result in the Bali conference is a typical example of this because if we cannot advance with this single undertaking, let's say what let's see what we can do. What parts will we be able to advance in? What are the elements that we can make progress in? And this is typical of an organization that is trying to advance in the agenda. But it's very hard to say, quite frankly, how much the new director general can do to make the continuity of the negotiations feasible in their entire scope, in the way that this was presented initially where we halted. The world is always evolving, so it's not up to the director general to decide 
the way forward for the organization. The way forward will be decided by the members. What the Director General can do, in my opinion, is to, once we have established that the members want to advance in this negotiating agenda, the Director General has the ob obligation of making this feasible. And how can he or she do this? He or she will listen to the parts, will listen to all of the stakeholders, and say, my perception is that the sensitivities are these, this is the desire of the group, maybe we can't do everything everybody wants, but I see that there is space to do some things. And this is something that cannot be done, but maybe this other topic can be taken forward. And this is the negotiation exercise that is done. We must test alternatives. There are several things that the members no, on the contrary. Nobody has this map. Nobody has a map. There are countries that don't, don't, e don't even have a map for their own desires. They don't know what they can sell internally even. And this is a complicated map. And that's where we have to use the knowledge of a director general that must know not only the organization and the trade sector itself, it must, he or she must be aware of the history of the negotiations. Okay, let's say we agreed on a topic and then we take a look at the wording. And since I'm there for several years, I'd say, no, okay, this was established over here because country A wanted this, country B wanted something else, and this was a commitment, a compromise that was made by both parties. And here we see that this other objective cannot be fulfilled. And somebody else who is not aware of the history of the negotiation and the sensitivities that exist between the countries, they won't know how to disarm the spirits and reach a consensus. So it's quite important for us to know what each country is willing to do, can do. And this is a very hard thing to do. We know, for instance, you're from France Press. We know, for instance, that several of the sensitivities, intuitively speaking, be this is something that exists in Europe in certain areas, for instance, in the agricultural area. But how many people know the extent of that sensitivity? What is the limit? to those sensitivities. So you can, it's only a handful. The multilateral system has very few people who are aware of this type of situation. And this is a type of contribution that we can provide. We participated in several different processes. I participated in all of the ministerial conferences of the WTO except for Cancun. I was not in Cancun, but it was the only meeting in which I did not participate in. I was dedicating myself to another area here in Itamarachi, but knowing who is who, the purpose of each of the members, the objectives, and this is even a personal uh, a specificity of the representatives and it's very important to have this type of sensitivity and this is valid for all areas of life not only the WTO but this map the simplicity with which you place your question let's advance with the discussions let's move on to the Doha round uh, nobody knows about this and if somebody says they know about what will happen in the future they will not have my vote I'm from Reuters. What actions could the WTO adopt in the case of um, a currency unbalance? How can we reduce the impact of these currency unbalances in the international trade? This is a discussion that we're having in Geneva now. Each member has a different perspective. 
some feel that we don't have to do anything right now, that the WTO already has mechanisms that are not perfect but could help to correct certain distortions. For instance, you have the mechanisms for trade defense, you have the compensation mechanisms, you have the safeguards that can be applied, but our assessment was that in Brazil that in none of these mechanisms were conceived taking into consideration the currency, the exchange rate. But maybe we, it will be important to have a mechanism. But before we discuss this, the members should reach an agreement about what is the role of the WTO. The WTO has a role to fulfill. And what is this role? How can it contribute better to these efforts? How can it dialogue with other entities, with other forums that are talking about this topic? It's quite curious because the WTO was talking about the exchange rate. And I know that the IMF is working on this, is adopting several attitudes and running studies and surveys about the exchange rate. But these entities do not communicate among themselves. The IMF is doing something, and the WTO is doing something else. And this is unbelievable, and this will have to change. And this is already changing, because the WTO is taking an initiative to change this. It's not Brazil, but the WTO is inviting a representative of the IMF to participate in the next meeting of the working group that is, part that is studying the exchange rate situation that will happen in April, so that we can start this dialogue. We're still defining this process. Your question does not have an immediate answer yet. Viviane Novaes from Program Global Rural. I would like to obtain some information about the dispute settlement uh, regarding cotton between the U.S. and Brazil. The U.S. committed to send to Brazil as a compensation of the subsidies $147 million per year. This agreement expired in September of last year. I'd like to know how the negotiations are now. Nothing has been defined yet, but what can Brazil do in case this agreement is not renewed? And a third issue is, is this money still being transferred or allocated to Brazil, or has the agreement come to an end already and these funds are no longer being passed? This annual amount is paid every month. Every month we receive a deposit. One twelfth of the $147 million that were agreed on. First of all, this bilateral understanding that was consolidated in a memorandum of understanding between Brazil and the United States, it has not been concluded yet. It did not expire in September. It's still in effect. There are two situations in which this understanding would be concluded. The first one would be due to a denunciation or a claim by each of the parties. So at any moment, Brazil or the U.S. can say, OK, our agreement is no longer in place, and we have a deadline of 30 or 60 days so that the mechanisms that are included in the agreement stop working, stop functioning. The second situation is when the United States enact another legislation after the current legislation that they have in effect in the United States. And in a meeting I participated in in Washington last year, we said that the an extension of the current programs would not be a succeeding legislation. It would be a continuity of the current programs, actually. This means that the second issue, the second possibility of concluding the agreement would not happen with the extension of the programs. If the agreement would continue in effect if the programs were only extended. In that same meeting, we expressed our concern that an extension, an undetermined an extension would be hard to accept unless we had an advancement in the negotiations 
that could show us that we were going in the direct, correct direction. Back then, we decided that a short-term extension until February or March, for instance, of this year, would not generate or would not uh, terminate the bilateral agreement. Back then, we didn't have any conversations about an extension until September. We didn't have a conversation about this. Nobody thought that this was feasible, and back then we did not talk about this. We have to go back to the discussions to see what we can do, because since the, the extension would last until September, and both countries would sit to talk about this, the first conversation will be held over the phone. I will not participate. I will no longer be, because of the campaign, I won't have time, but I will no longer be the representative to the WTO. He will replace me in these negotiations, and he will have a conversation with the U.S. delegates by telephone, and this topic will be brought up. What I can say is that my feeling right now is that there is there's no signal either from Brazil or the US that we will abruptly terminate this bilateral agreement if we still have negotiations and the engagement of both parties and advancements in the conversations even from the technical perspective I think that the parts are interested in obtaining a mutually satisfactory understanding. For a long period of time, these conversations advanced very little because Congress is analyzing this, trying to approve legislation on this, and the Agricultural Act well, it came to a standstill, and to the end of the year, this conversation become more intense, became more intense, and then we made significant progress. And so, while we were negotiating and maintaining the commitments that are included in the memorandum of understanding, but my impression is that there is no appetite from the U.S. or from Brazil of terminating this bilateral agreement. But this conversation has not yet started. It will begin next week. Okay? Caroline from Ca the Canal Rural. Brazil is studying establishing a dispute to challenge this issue of bovine meat of beef. The, the, has the WTO discussed this? Will you be dealing with this specific topic on your campaign? No, not in my campaign. In Geneva, while I was in Geneva, until the end of la last year, we received a mission from the Ministry of Agriculture, especially from the sanitary area. We summoned several delegations. They met in the Brazilian mission in Geneva. And these employees from the Ministry of Agriculture made a presentation about the situation. They explained the situation and they demonstrated with evidence that they had that it was not a risk situation. And the OAS continued to maintain the risk classification for Brazil. And there was no reason for the situation to change and they asked countries that had imposed restrictive measures, they, they asked the removal of these restrictions, and this is what happened in Geneva, and I witnessed this dialogue. It was in the end of the year, I'm not quite sure what the date was, but they were there in the end of the year, and this was even in the press. In Geneva, this was the last step regarding an issue of uh, involving a dispute settlement mechanism. I received no news about this in Geneva, but this does not mean that conversations in Brasilia are not taking place, but this has not yet reached 
Geneva. So I think you should go to the Ministry of Agriculture or even to the dispute settlement unit here in, Brazi in Brasilia, but I don't think that we are in this point in the negotiations. But it, this doesn't mean that we're not thinking about it, okay? Last question. Three quick questions. You're very ambitious. Three questions. The first, we have three candidates from Latin America, Costa Rica, Mexico, and you. And it seems that this uh, makes it difficult for Latin America to have uh, a feasible candidate. And from the nine candidates, eight are from developing countries. Only New Zealand is from a developed country. So I don't know if there's a lot of consensus in this. The second question, you mentioned that Brazil, you didn't mention Brazil wants the candidate, wants the director general to be a representative from a developing country. You didn't, you mentioned Latin America and Asia, you didn't mention Africa. Is there a reason for this? And thirdly, you and Mohammed from Kenya, you are the only ones who do not hold a ministerial position right now. Could this be a problem for your candidacy? Could you lose support due to this fact? Let's start from your last question regarding the ministerial level. I think that this can be used as an excuse by somebody who does not want to support our candidacy because I don't have a ministerial status. But there's not a written rule about this, and there's no type of evidence that the ministerial level is necessarily more important, more productive, or more effective for the organization. Actually, throughout the history of GATT, until the launch and creation of the WTO, none of the director generals of GATT came from ministerial level. None of them, only after WTO. And if this is used as an example, all of the negotiation rounds that were concluded were concluded with director generals who had never been ministers. All of those who were ministers were unable to conclude negotiation rounds. So in this aspect, I think it would be an argument in favor of those who are not ministers. In Asia, why didn't I mention Asia? Because, as I said, the Brazilian government thinks it's healthy to have an alternance between developed and developing countries and also an alternance between geographical regions. And I think all of the geographical regions can present candidates that are apt for the function. In the previous election, Asia already had a representative occupying uh, the director general's post. And since Asia has already occupied the presidency, the director general's position, and the regions that have not yet occupied this post are Africa and Latin America, but this doesn't mean that Asia cannot present an excellent candidate. This does not mean that. but we see that this is a systemic issue. It's important to have this alternance and this turnover so that we can have greater credibility in the system because everybody, so that everybody knows that they will have an opportunity to lead the organization. Regarding both issues, regarding the eight developing countries, we see that these are multiple aspects. Asia presented two Latin America presented three, and I think that this is natural. I don't see this as a problem. I don't think that we will have a cannibalism in the candidacies. These are countries that thought that they had good candidates and presented them so that the members could choose the one they thought best. But what 
for those who are familiar with the electoral system, this is how it works. Once the campaigns are open or are over in May and April, we will have the selection process. Three ambassadors, the president of the general council, the unit for dispute settlement, and also the ambassador from the other area, they will consult the members in different moments and they will examine the candidates that have a greater consensus among them. And then after this first round, they will choose a certain number of candidates. They will eliminate a certain number of candidates because they have no consensus. These candidates will remove themselves from the selection process traditionally. After a second stage, another uh, another candidate will remove him or herself from the process and so on and so forth. And then we will go through a second, third, fourth stage and when we reach the end of the process there will be one candidate per region or two candidates per region. I don't see this as a deficiency of the system or of the candidacies themselves because my perception specifically is that once you reach the end of the process, the origin of the candidate matters less and less. There's no obligation in this sense. This will depend on the conviction of the country in terms of their perspective about who will be the best candidate to take on the position of Director General. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.